Our uh, next speaker is Svante Pabo, who's um, from that place up there. Which you, I was going to read it out, but you might as well read it yourself. Um, now, Svante is an expert in plotting the evolutionary tree of humans. And this is not something that's easily done. Lots and lots of new evidence comes up all the time that sort of casts doubt on all sorts of things. And uh, Svante's been one of those leading the description of how we evolved as a species. He's going to be specifically talking today about his work analysing the DNA of Neanderthals and Denisovans, comparing their genomes to modern day humans. Okay, thank you. So, just like Arnold, I just like to start by thanking the Royal Institution then and the Company of Biologists for this opportunity to come here. Um, and what I wanted to do then is use my time such that in the first half of the talk, I will actually not talk about the brain, but about our attempts to retrieve DNA from old bones, particularly from Neanderthals and other extinct forms of humans, and a bit about what that tells us about human origins and about early human history. And in the second half, then, I want to come a little bit to the brain and discuss what we might learn about differences in the brain between people who live today and our extinct relatives by studying these genomes we find in the bones. And as you will see, that part is very speculative and just beginning and really just describing what will happen in the next 10 years or so. So, but before we start, I just want to remind you about what you all are aware of, I think, that our DNA, our genome, is stored on the chromosomes in almost all the cells in our body. And it's stored in the form of DNA, of this famous double helix, and when new cells are born, especially in our germline then, when a new individual should be born, the two strands of this molecule comes apart, and they each serve as a template to form a new, new molecule. And the information, so the information is here essentially twice. It's in the order of these four bases, abbreviated A, T, C, and G. And a new complementary form is built in a very exact process. But nothing is, of course, completely perfect in nature. So now and again, an error is made. Say, the wrong base against a C, a G should be built in, but an A is built in. And if that is not repaired fast enough, it will become a mutation that will be passed on to the next generation. So every baby that is born carries something like 100, 200 new mutations that are not there, neither in the father nor in the mother. And we can observe these old mutations as differences in these DNA sequences in the population. So if we compare a genome in one of you with me, for example, we find a difference every approximately 1,200, 1,300 such bases. And if we go to a chimpanzee, which is further away from us from an evolutionary point of view, we find more such differences, approximately one difference every 100 such bases or so. And if you're now interested in the evolutionary history of a piece of our genome or our whole genome, you will use these differences to try to reconstruct the history that underlies these differences. So in this case, it's then very simple. The two human DNA sequences go back to a common ancestor rather recently, and something like 10 times further back is there a common ancestor shared with the chimpanzee also. And our genome, as you may know, is composed of over three billion such bases or nucleotides. And so we have about three million differences or so between any two genomes, between the two genomes you carry from your mothers and fathers or between two individuals. So it's a lot of information to try to reconstruct history. And when you now start doing that on a genome-wide scale, what you will find is that you find the most variation in Africa. So if you look at Africans and compare them to people living outside Africa, although there are a lot more people outside Africa, of course, they have less variation. And not only that, the variants of DNA sequences you find outside Africa generally have close relatives that exist inside Africa. But there is an addition then, a component of the variation inside Africa that you don't find outside Africa. So the interpretation of that is that modern humans arose in Africa and a part of the variation, so to say, went out and colonized the rest of the world. And by studying 
patterns in these DNA sequences, how variants are linked with each other across chromosomes, you can estimate about the time when that happened by comparing variation outside here to inside Africa. And it's in the order of 100,000 years ago or so. So this is a recent African origin of modern humans, about 100, maybe 200,000 years ago. But there is, of course, a problem, if you like, with that model, is that when modern humans then expand across the world, they were not alone at that time. There were other forms of humans that had been there for quite a long time. Most famously at that time, Neanderthals in Western Eurasia, and other forms in Asia that's a bit less well described what they are. So, um, something that we are very interested in is then to study the relationship of present-day people to these extinct forms of humans. When did we have common ancestor? What happened when we met, etc. So this then requires that you go back to old bones and try to retrieve DNA from them. So this is work that now goes back almost 30 years and started with ancient Egyptian mummies then in the 80s that look very well preserved when you look at them. They are then two, three, four thousand years old. And they look very well preserved, but if you start looking microscopically in their tissues, which I started doing at that time, it's generally a very depressing thing to do. So this is a modern human muscle, where you see the muscle fibers, you see the cell nuclei where the DNA would be preserved. And if you look on Egypt, in an Egyptian mummy like the one we just looked at, it looks something like this. You barely see there are muscle fibers there. You see no cell nuclei, there is no DNA preserved. So that's the situation in the vast majority of such samples you look at. Fortunately, not always. This is the first mummy that was an exception to that, where you could see cell nuclei and could extract DNA. So here in the skin here, you can see things that are cell nuclei. So sometimes there are small amounts of DNA preserved. If you go on and extract that DNA and look at it, what you will find is it's degraded to short, short pieces. If you extract DNA from a blood sample in me, you can have pieces of 10, 20,000 base uh, nucleotides. This is degraded to 50, 60, 70 bases. In addition, there are chemical modifications you'll have to deal with. So if you now want to look at a longer piece of DNA, you have to sort of retrieve short overlapping pieces and sort of puzzle together a longer piece. For lots of these technical reasons, it's very little DNA there, it's degraded, it's chemically modified and so on. Most work for the longest time was just focused not on the really interesting part of our genome, in the nucleus where most of our DNA is from mothers and fathers, but this tiny little mitochondrial genome that we have from our mothers that exists in hundreds of copies outside the cell nucleus. And today it's really routine to study DNA in zoological collections that are then from the last 100, 200 years. From some extinct animals, this was an exhibition at the Smithsonian Institution a while ago of animals, extinct animals from which DNA sequences have now been retrieved. But our big interest are then relatives of humans, particularly then Neanderthals. So this is a reconstructed Neanderthal skeleton compared with a modern human skeleton. So Neanderthals were these sort of robust forms of humans. They appear then in Europe and in Western Asia in a fossil record, depending on how you now define a Neanderthal, maybe 300,000 years ago or so. And they exist until about 30,000 years ago when they become extinct. So um, there are two big ideas since decades around what happened when modern humans come out of Africa and meet Neanderthals in Europe and other forms in Asia. One is that modern humans come and replace these guys with no mixture whatsoever. And another idea is that yes, you come out of Africa, you meet these forms, you eventually replace them, but they do mix with them. And these two ideas then give very different predictions for how a DNA sequence or a genome from a Neanderthal should relate to present day people. In this situation here, where they contributed, then people in Europe today should on average be a bit closer to Neanderthals than people in Africa where they've never been Neanderthals. 
Here, it should really be no difference. The Neanderthal is equally different from people in Africa as from people in Europe. So you can see these two ideas then as a continuum, if you like, from total replacement, zero contribution from these earlier forms, to total continuity that really no one believes in, that Neanderthals would be the direct ancestors of Europeans, for example. So the first chance to test this came in the, late, in the early 90s when we got samples from the first Neanderthal. It was really the first Neanderthal that was found in 1856 in Neanderthal in Germany and gave its name to the Neanderthals then from, from this skeleton. You work then under clean room conditions to avoid contaminating the experiment with DNA from yourself. Camber assembly study, a little piece, a variable part of this mitochondrial genome, puzzling it together from short little pieces you retrieve. And then estimated such a phylogenetic tree for the mitochondrial genome. And what we then saw was that all the humans go back, went back to a common mitochondrial ancestor here. And quite a bit further back was there a common ancestor shared with the mitochondrial DNA of Neanderthals, about half a million years or so. So from this perspective, it was quite clear, no human today run around with a mitochondrial genome from a Neanderthal. Uh, also several other Neanderthals that people have looked at since then. So in this scheme of things, it's sort of total replacement here. But this also gave us an estimate then for a time the oldest time, say half a million back or more recently, was a population split to Neanderthals. And that also told us that the Neanderthals could not have been very different from us. Because we also know that if we compare a piece of my DNA with a piece of your DNA and estimate the time back to a common ancestor, it's on average about half a million years. And there's a huge variance around that. So there is no problem to find a piece in my genome where I differ from a piece in your genome by up to a million years. That is going back further than this population split to Neanderthals. So this means that without studying their nuclear genome at all, we could say that for some part of the genome, for sure, I will be closer to a Neanderthal here than someone in the audience. If you go to another part of the genome, someone else will be closer to the Neanderthal. But this still didn't mean that it would be uninteresting to study the Neanderthal genome because there would still be things here that sets us apart, things that would have changed here after we separate from Neanderthals. But I think until eight years ago, I'm sort of on the published record of saying we will never be able to study the nuclear genome of Neanderthals. It's all too degraded, it's too little there, we can't distinguish it from contamination and so on. And you should never make predictions like that in science, I think, because you're generally proven wrong. And what proves you wrong is generally technology. And in this case, it was really new techniques to sequence DNA that allowed you to sequence millions and millions of DNA sequences quickly and inexpensively. So you can now just take DNA from such a sample, sequence random fragments of DNA in it, make your little database and see what of it might come from the Neanderthal. And the first place where this worked was in Croatia, in southern Europe, this cave from this bone, which is 38,000 years old. And the first thing that you will see is that the fragments you find here that have similarity to the human genome and seem to come from Neanderthals are then really very short, 50, 60 base pairs, hardly anything over 200. The other thing is that the vast majority in those bones of the DNA you find there is not at all from the Neanderthal, but from bacteria and fungi that colonized the bone when it was laying there for 40,000 years in the cave. Our very best samples of something like approaching 4% endogenous DNA. So we worked a lot on the techniques to become more efficient in coming from the bones to something you could feed into the sequencing machines. The machines got better. We looked through a lot of sites to find the best bones in terms of the percent Neanderthal DNA relative to bacterial DNA. Found three bones in this cave that were particularly good. Sequenced a lot of DNA from them. At the time it seemed a lot to sequence sort of a, a billion DNA fragments. You then match them to the human genome to see how they fit there. And at the time we sequenced around 3 billion base pairs 
but from random fragments. And there are three billion base pairs in the human genome, so, and they, these fragments will fall here and there. So you will sometimes have places you've seen twice or three times, but also miss a lot of places. <laughs> so we ended up having a little over half of the Neanderthal genome. But you could then at least begin to ask some questions. So for example, what happened when one met Neanderthals? Did one mix or not? So you can, of course, make a prediction as we did earlier, that if it was so that when modern humans met Neanderthals and mixed, then we would expect people in Europe today to share more genetic variants with Neanderthals than people in Africa. So to ask that question then, we went out and sequenced five people from around the world to compare to, and started out by doing a really simple analysis. We just compared two genomes, say from two present-day Africans, they should be equally distant from the Neanderthal, right? Because Neanderthals have never been in Africa, so it's no reason to think it should have contributed DNA more to one than to the other here. So we just then see how often does the Neanderthal match a variant in one African or the other African. And indeed, it's about 50-50. The same thing if we look outside Africa, a French person and from from Papua, 50-50. But if we compare a European individual to an African individual, we find statistically significantly more matching to the European. That really surprised me, because I suspected that there was no mixing, actually. But it turned out to be. But what was even more surprising was that we went and took the Chinese individual compared to Africans. It was again more matching to the Chinese person. Although there had not been Neanderthals in China, as far as I would tell. And going to Papua New Guinea, again, we found the same thing, although everyone would agree there had never been Neanderthals there. So the model that came out of that was saying when modern humans come out of Africa, they probably have to pass the Middle East. There were Neanderthals there. So to explain this situation here, there were Neanderthals there in the Middle East. If one then mixed with Neanderthals there, and those modern humans went on to colonize the rest of the world, they would have sort of carried with them this Neanderthal DNA contribution in their genome, out into areas where Neanderthals had never been. To the extent that today, in the order of 2% or so of the DNA of everyone outside Africa come from Neanderthals. So we published this back in 2010. There has been a lot of scientific follow-up on this. Uh, that has been very rewarding to follow. There's also been a lot of public interest, I should say. We receive a lot of emails and letters about this. And after a while, I started noticing a pattern in, in these mails. It was mostly men who wrote to us and self-identified as Neanderthals. <laughs> and often sent pictures of themselves and volunteered to give blood samples and so on. And there were strikingly few women. So I sort of presented this to my students, and they are very critical. They say, oh, it's all ascertainment. Women are not as interested in molecular genetics as men, so women will not write to you. But I went back to my mails and found out that that's not at all the case, because there are quite a few women who write to us and say they are married to Neanderthals. <laughs> Whereas to date, there has not been a single uh, man who has written and said he's married to a Neanderthal woman. So there is clearly some very interesting genetic patterns there that, that we have to pursue. But we have, of course, done other things than then than counting emails. We've sort of studied other forms of, of humans. There are, of course, many other extinct forms of humans than Neanderthals around. And we are very happy to work with colleagues in Russia that excavate, particularly in Siberia, Professor Derevyanko here, at particularly at this place called the Niseva Cave in southern Siberia this place, where in 2008 they found in one of the galleries here a tiny little bone that they were actually very skilled at realizing it might come from a human. It's a part of the last phalanx of a pinky. So we extracted DNA from this bone and it turned out to be well preserved, amazingly well preserved. 70% of it actually was endogenous DNA. So we sequenced its genome. And it turned out to be related to Neanderthals, but quite far back. So DNA sequences in this and in Neanderthals sort of go back something like 800,000 years, 
common ancestor with humans. And somewhere like 650,000 years back, a common ancestor shared with Neanderthals. So this individual sort of have a shared origin with Neanderthals, but since then, Neanderthals have a long independent history. So we sort of dubbed these things uh, the Nisivans after this first place where they were found. Since then, we have developed methods to be much more efficient in how we retrieve this DNA. So we now have a very high coverage Denisova genome, a very high accuracy, where we really have 99.9% .9 of the genome, the part of the genome we can study. And we begin to see quite interesting things when we now have very accurate DNA sequences. For example, we see what we would expect. We sort of catch evolution red-handed, if, if you want. If you compare this genome to present-day humans, we sort of have missing mutations here, because this individual died 50,000, 60,000 years ago, and they have had not enough, as much time as us to accumulate mutations. So if we assume that uh, we, we miss sort of uh, 1 to 1.3 percent of the mutations back to the common ancestor with the chimp, if we assume that this is 6.5 million years, this would correspond to 60 to 80,000 years ago approximately. There are many caveats with this. We don't know the mutation rate in humans really well. There are many sort of, but I think in the future we will actually be able to date bones. And it's fascinating that this bone is actually so small, so you can't do a carbon date from it. But you can retrieve its genome now and arrive at an approximate date from, from looking at the genome. We can look if these guys contributed to modern humans. Indeed, they did. They did so in, in uh, Oceania. So they're presumably more widespread in the past. So it's fascinating, I think, and it's sort of what will be in the future, that from very, very tiny bones such as these, you can reconstruct quite a lot of population history, and even date them from small things. We have no morphological information whatsoever. We don't know how these individuals look uh, at all. So to just summarize then what we think about Neanderthal origins and, and modern human origins, think Neanderthals had some origin in Africa, maybe half a million years ago or so. Their ancestors, they were not Neanderthals at that place, come out sort of in Western Eurasia, they evolve into what we call Neanderthals, and in Eastern Eurasia to what we call Denisovans. That's not to say there were only Denisovans there, there were clearly other forms of extinct humans also. We also don't know where the border between these groups were. We know that at some point here in southern Siberia, there were Neanderthals and some other point Denisovans. So modern humans then have an origin in Africa, come out of Africa, start spreading seriously, say 50, 60,000 years ago. They mix with Neanderthals, presumably in the Middle East. They continue to spread across the world, and there is some indication now that they are mixed a second time in Asia, because Asians have actually slightly more Neanderthal DNA than uh, people in Europe. There is this mixture in Southeast Asia with the Nisivans, and continue out in Oceania. Then these archaic forms become extinct, but they then live on a little bit today, so that 2.5% of the genomes of people, say, in Eurasia, are from Neanderthals, and then an additional 5% or so from the Nisivans in Oceania. This is now, and I wouldn't exclude, I should also say, that we will in the future find other cases of that mixture, for example in China or in Africa, where clearly also modern humans spread and presumably also mixed with other forms there. But all these things will not add up to very much of our genome. That is very clear. I would doubt that we will come up to 10% or so from this archaic form. So the big picture is still replacement, but there is a little bit of contribution then from these earlier forms. So if you had a model, I'd like to call this a leaky replacement or so. So the past, wow, this took longer than I thought, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say a few words about brains and brain evolution also at the end. Do I have five minutes for that? Um, this is embarrassing. Uh, so I think another thing is, one thing is that we can now reconstruct 
population history, as we have discussed. But something else that we can now do when we have these high quality genomes here from our closest evolutionary relatives is that we can start focus on things that changed here. So things that changed in our genome after we separated from Neanderthals and became present in everybody today, no matter where we live on the planet. So things that changed at this point, very recent in our history. Why would those changes be interesting? Well, I think that there are some things that are unique to modern humans. Neanderthals had just as big brains as we had. Yet, at the beginning of their history, say 300,000 years ago, and towards the end of their history, they made very similar technologies. Only quite late, when they may have met modern humans, you start seeing new things they do. So, one thing that changed with modern humans is clearly technology. In the 100,000 years we have been around, we all agree, I think, that our technology has changed a lot. And it starts becoming regionalized. Different parts of the world start doing different technologies. There are some indications of body decorations or so on in Neanderthals, but art that we intuitively recognize as art today, that depict things, comes only with modern humans. And there are other things such as how we spread across the world. To me, it is striking that these earlier forms of humans existed in Africa and in Eurasia for two million years or so. They never came to America, never to Australia, never to Madagascar. It's actually, with one exception, maybe there are no indication they ever crossed water where you don't see land on the other side. Modern humans start spreading out of Africa between 50, 60, 70,000 years ago. And in that short time, it came not only to America, Australia, but to every little speck of island that is habitable, right? That clearly has to do with technology to, to sail on the ocean. But there is also some madness involved, I think. How many people must not sail out on the Pacific before you have hit Easter Island and just disappear? And now we go to Mars, so we never stop. So I think there is something different there. And a hope, of course, a hope I have is that some of the biological background of that will be hidden in this catalog of recent changes in our genome here. So if we now look at this, and we are very stringent, so we say we look at things that changed here, and is present in everybody today, as far as we can tell, by looking at there are over a thousand complete human genomes that have been sequenced, is present in all of those, and in other databases of human variation, everyone has it. Yet the Neanderthal and the Denisovan look like the apes. So it's really something that changed here and became fixed. We have that whole list now since six months or so. Whoops, sorry. And that's not a tremendously long list. It's around 30,000 single such nucleotides that have changed in our genome. They're, so and some of them fall in things that look like they could be more functional in regions that may regulate how genes are turned on and off. If we just look at proteins, so the molecules that actually do the jobs in our cells, there are 96 such building blocks, amino acids in proteins, that have changed. So if to just give you a flavor for this, if we look at this list, we can look at all the genes in our genome. There's 87 genes that encode proteins that carry such changes. So the fascinating thing now for the future is to stare at this and try to figure out what might be important there. And of course, we like to think that the brain is something special in modern humans. So one thing you can do is just to say which of these proteins are expressed in the brain and in particularly interesting part of the brain. And of course, particularly interesting part of the brain are the ones Arnold talked to you about. The epithelium where the cerebral cortex is form, formed during fetal development. And interestingly enough, there are sort of a significant enrichment relative to control of these proteins expressed in this ventricular zone that you heard Arnold uh, talk about here. So this is this epithelium that he described to you in a paper by Arnold. So, and if we look at these proteins there, there are particularly five proteins that are confined in their expression in the brain to that epithelium. And it's quite interesting to find that three of them are actually involved in the mitotic spindle. 
So this machinery that pulls the chromosomes apart when the cells divide. So it's very tempting to think that these cleavage planes of how these neuronal precursor cells divide that is so important for what neurons are then formed may have changed in some way here. But it's not about being, making a bigger brain, as I said, but perhaps about making different types of neurons instead. So I think this is a sort of hypothesis, this is just speculation. What will now happen in the next 10 years or so is that one will study these changes and the regulatory changes in a really systematic way. So I think a systematic study of these things is really what should be the goal in this area for the next 10 years or so. And with that, I thank you for your attention.